Go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. The objective of this side event is to share with you all various initiatives which Women's Health and Education Center, its acronym is WHEC, uh, has undertaken in health sector and in education sector. We believe education for all uh, and health for all are at the core of achieving United Nations 2030 agenda. Our distinguished panel of experts will share with you their experiences and their expert opinions. Help us to plan future initiatives in education and health. We welcome everyone. Why do we need improved coordination between education sector and health sector? Education and health are intertwined. Education helps health while health improves learning potential. Education and uh, health together serve as the foundation for a better world. Join us to achieve worldwide literacy and access to quality health care in every country for every woman, every mother, every child, everywhere. Internet is the most popular mass media ever invented and it has almost become our lifeline. Whether we hate internet or absolutely love internet, it has become an essential part and backbone of our health and educational systems in every country. Unfortunately, over the years, somehow this glorious and glamorous internet, which was invented for new ways of communications and information exchange, got bulldozed and filled with garbage. But still, an internet is very popular. Why? In my opinion, the internet is helping to satisfy three basic human needs. Our desire for knowledge, our desire to communicate, and most importantly, a sense of belonging. Time has come to plan and develop a new internet network, a better internet for education and health. Its purpose we propose through this network, the institutions from all over the world should be able to share, pool and contribute to the development of their societies. This hopefully helps to establish new teaching initiatives in education and health. Generating innovation through research and contributing to the enrichment of existing university programs uh, and promoting cultural diversity worldwide is the objective. The Women's Health and Education Center's partnership with the United Nations, WHO, and UNESCO is a collaboration to achieve the hopes and dreams of sustainable development. Global initiatives of WHEC will provide grants to least developed countries identified by United Nations Development Program for the improvement of maternal and child health. We are also striving for internet classrooms between the United States of America, EU, and other developed countries and developing countries, the educational projects and programs in health sector and education sectors. WHEC will provide free online access to least developed countries in health sector and education sectors. So join us to fulfill, to fulfill this purpose and mission. Our global health line link access project aims to catalyze collaborative networks cutting across disciplines, sectors and borders and seek science and technology based solutions to development challenges. Join us to advance the causes of peace, health and development. A transformative agenda and leadership is vital. If girls, women, and minorities are to realize their health and well being and to flourish and prosper, our working group urges the world's leader to enhance their efforts in pursuit of this agenda. Squarely on human rights, 
principles of equality, inclusiveness, non-discrimination, participation, and accountability. Evidence shows that this action can create the transformation necessary to secure more peaceful, fairer, and more inclusive societies for everyone. People love personal media. Power is increasingly in the hands of users. Think about the blogging phenomenon. Today, digital information is essential for about nearly every aspect of our lives, and it is being created at an astonishing rate. Hence, in 2013, we lost our global health line in collaboration with the Reproductive Health Research Division of the World Health Organization to provide internet access to research initiatives in reproductive health worldwide is doing very well. We are serving our, uh, in 227 countries and territories, about 30 to 14 million subscribers every year. And it is disseminated in six languages, English, French, Spanish, Russian, Chinese, and Arabic. Our projects and initiatives are coming of age. So join us to help you, to serve you better. Established in 2001 in United States of America, WHEC undertakes initiatives with the UN, WHO, and UNESCO to achieve the mission, education for all and health for all. Many healthcare providers, advocacy group, policymakers, and consumers are concerned that electronic system, telesystem, and online educational programs might help individuals and communities with greater resources while it will leave behind those with limited access to technology. Let us not leave anybody behind. Let us not leave anybody offline. We can do this. Currently, world's population is more than 7 billion. They all have one common dream and one common wish and desire. That is, their children are educated by the finest teachers, schools, and universities to achieve a prosperous future. This is a timeless wish and a timeless desire. With this vision, when Women's Health and Education Center had submitted a proposal to UNDPI, United Nations in 2001, it was very well received. And on 24th October, 2002, an e-health platform, womenshealthsection.com was launched for various types of collaboration and accesses. In 2006, WHEC began developing scientifically based practice bulletin, practice guidelines. These are derived from the best information available from various scientific journals and academic societies network to improve clinical practice efficiency and consideration for health cost with recommendation directly linked to the services. As the practice of medicine evolves, so too do WHEC practice bulletins. Our faculty is from the finest universities and teaching hospitals from the USA and many other countries who have donated their time and talent to plan and develop these initiatives with WHEC. I'm grateful to the Physicians Board for their contributions. Big question, where do we go from here? WHEC's collaboration with WHO Academy and UNESCO will bring together adult learning, behavior science programs for youth development and cutting edge learning technologies such as artificial intelligence and virtual reality. WHO's norms, standards, and evidence will deliver high impact, accredited, and tailored multilingual learning to meet the needs of 7 billion people of the world. WHEC is looking forward to develop strong collaboration with all the UN member states and WHO member states and make this initiative affordable and accessible to everyone and everywhere. Proceeding in this way, we believe this will not only strengthen the capacity building, but will also preserve cultural integrity and will increase the access to such technologies for those who need it the most. It is the poor and marginalized in our society and in our world that have most to gain from advances in healthcare 
and online education courses. Sadly, at this point, they are often the groups who benefit the least. Government commitment is necessary. Long-term government commitment based on strategic plan is a prerequisite for the successful implementation of internet classrooms in education and health in every country, rich and poor alike. Join this movement and we welcome everyone. Thank you. Now it is indeed my pleasure to introduce Dr. Deborah Rowe, who is the moderator of this side event. She is the president of US Partnerships for Education and Sustainable Development and works with higher education networks for sustainability globally. Uh, she's an author and editor of numerous publications. After completing Bachelor in Arts from Yale University, she received her MA, MBA, and PhD in business from the University of Michigan. She's an author and editor of numerous publications, and it's indeed a pleasure and a dream to work with her. Go ahead, Deborah. Thank you. I am delighted to be with you today. I'm very much looking forward to sharing some what I think will be very exciting information for you. So I'm going to share my screen. And here we go. So I've only put together two slides for you, but it does give you an entree into an exciting world of how we can improve cooperation between education and health. So let me show you. I have resources and initiatives for you, and I'm going to name just a few. I could spend a lot of time today, but we've got a great set of speakers and I want them to have the time that they need. So first, through the US Department of Education, we received a grant called Sustainability Improves Student Learning. We found uh, that when students can engage in helping to create a better world, they are more empowered, they're more motivated to learn. And so um, we put together this initiative. Um, I will show you all of these resources. I'm going to drop them into the chat so you can access them, but I'm also gonna show you the, the, some of the web pages so you can see what's there. This initiative was first organized by the STEM disciplines. So we had 13 academic societies um, that were working on STEM. So the chemistry teachers and the biological sciences, et cetera, 13 of them um, put together this resource. It's got learning activities and it um, resources that are global, but also go across to the specifics of each of the disciplines. We had a great math workshop in there too. Do you know that there's a textbook for calculus that's all about climate change and what we can do with solutions, for example? The next resource that I have for you is the life skills series that we've started at WHEC. You will see in the next newsletter, an article that provides an overview for that. We know that a lot of students are struggling both with mental health because of COVID, but also with how do I be effective as a student? I've not been able to be in the classroom due to COVID or I have other strains and stressors in my life. So this life series includes very practical um, tidbits that teachers can use in their classrooms that students can use directly, things like how to procrastinate less, how to uh, take tests effectively. But the series also includes those important things we need to, to uh, take psychology out of having to wait until things are kind of screwed up and you got to go see a therapist, but give it to the students ahead of time as preventative mental health, the whole world of positive psychology. And this will bring in items like how to build healthy relationships, how to use emotional intelligence, how to reduce stress and how to cope with stress more effectively. So each of the newsletters that come out of WHEC will have a couple of other items um, that's, that can be used directly in the classroom, but can also be used by students and others to improve the quality of their life and also to learn to be a more effective change agent to create a better world. Uh, the third thing I wanna talk about is educating for green jobs. Look, we have eight years left to reduce greenhouse gases by 50% 
in order to stay on, um, on schedule with the science-based targets that the scientists tell us we need to try to stabilize our climate. And so in order to make um, the solutions that we need and to implement them. And the good news is, in case you don't know, the solutions already exist. We have the technology, it's already cost-effective. It's just about getting them implemented and updating some policies that are in the way as well. But we also need a workforce that's ready, lots of green jobs. You can see all sorts of reports about all the green jobs and how it's gonna help lift people out of po poverty. You also see how disadvantaged communities aren't yet um, in this workforce and we need to reach out to them and that there is, this, is a gender disparity, that there are not enough women in the green jobs um, economy. So we did a global guidance document with UNEP. Um, it's got 85 wonderful resources, but also a framework that helps um, educators, policymakers, NGOs, program developers to see what we can do and need to do to build the green workforce for the clean energy transition and for climate solutions. Uh, we actually have an event coming up on Tuesday. We have over a thousand people who signed up. There's great interest in this, but there's also a great need for updating curricula. And this is a true not only in the environmental space, but a psychology class can contribute to this, a sociology class. The social sciences are needed. So are the natural sciences, so are the arts so that people understand uh, the urgency and the opportunities for the transition to a clean energy economy um, and a green and a sustainable economy. Um, so we have curricular updates, updated career guidance. We also need better internships and job placements. And so we are doing a series of events in the virtual learning community. All of that is on that link. I will be dropping it into the chat when I get done talking. Um, the next thing I wanna tell you about is uh, young adults came together and said that many of the older adults are not acting boldly enough to try to solve our urgent sustainability challenges and especially climate change because it's on such a short timeline and how it affects and increases poverty and human suffering around the world. So they put together a change maker toolkit, how to be an effective change maker to make the world a better place. And that's what that link is. And then, of course, I'm president of the U.S. Partnership for Education for Sustainable Development. We have all sorts of resources there. And so what I want to do now is just give you a little taste of if you click on those links, what's going to happen. So this is the Sustainability Improved Student Learning page. You can, the website that I talked about first, um, you can see there's a section on empowering students. There's a section for each of the different disciplinary perspectives. So you'll see these are all the STEM disciplines that contributed resources to this. And I noticed that we have medicine missing. So of course we need to update that to have that, but you see there's a lot there for you with teaching activities, other resources, even a self-assessment students can use to see what kind of a change agent they are. Um, the second website I wanna show you is the Green Workforce. Here's the Green Jobs for Youth. Once again, I'll be putting the links to all of these into the chat. And so this tells you about what the outcomes are in terms of helping students get those green jobs, getting rid of the gender disparity, or at least reducing it as much as we can. This tells you about the events that are upcoming. So that page, and it also has a link so that you can join a virtual community and hear more about the upcoming events. This shows you the beginning of the Environmental Changemaker Toolkit. Look at that table of contents self-assessments on how to be a change maker, video examples of change makers from around the world, and then how to cope with stress, how to take care of yourself, how to improve relationships with others, how to communicate more effectively, creating systemic change, how to find a job, and then learning tips, plus much more. So please, you know, take advantage of it, share it. If you have ideas on how to improve it, we're open to it. And then here's our US Partnership for Education for Sustainable Development. And if you click on our resources, you'll see we have resources in all these different sectors of society that we've compiled for you. We've got a wonderful take action page. Do you have trouble talking with people who are on a different part of the political spectrum than you are? Go to Dialogue Fixes. Do you wanna help with climate solutions? Go to Climate Fixes. Do you wanna be a change maker? 
You can look at the 42 videos from nine countries of people being change makers. Many, many of those videos are of women. Um, I love those videos. They're really transformative. And then a sustainability literacy test. So that's what we have for you. And I'll next um, hand it over to Rita so that she can introduce our next speaker. And I'll be dropping these links into the chat. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. It's indeed my pleasure to introduce Upasana Johan. Uh, she, I known her for more than five years, a young international advisor on girls' education with an experience working in nonprofit sectors, corporate sectors, and UN environment, along with a strong background in STEM. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, women empowerment projects and expansion activities. She is striving to gain experience in a diverse and challenging work environment to make a difference and make this world a better place for all. Her work and uh, rights, her work at this point is in the rural India and is legendary. And my pleasure to give the floor to Upasana. Go ahead, Upasana. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Thanks, everyone, for joining today and taking time out to be here with us and share your point of views. Uh, just sorry for the interruption, but I believe we do have our speaker, Taraji, also, but she's not able to let, we're not able to let her in somehow. But uh, anyways, Deborah is trying that right now. Okay, let me quickly share my screen with you all so that, okay, let me... While you're sharing your screen, Tara's not in the waiting room. So as soon as she shows up, I'll let her in. Okay, cool. I, I texted her. I'm not sure what is the problem, why she's not able to join in for some reason anyway. Okay. Why am I not seeing the option to share my screen? So if you go down to the bottom, do you see where it says mute and video? Do you see that line there? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, keep going to the right of the chat. There's a button that says share screen and you can click on that. Yeah, I can now, okay, yep. One second, let me see. I hope you guys can see my screen. Uh, maybe in a minute, it looks like you turned off your camera. And now you're doing a screen broadcast, which, okay, you're sharing your screen. Mm -hmm. Now you guys can see my, right? Yeah, but we're seeing multiple windows. There you go, there it is. Perfect. Great. Sorry for the trouble, guys. I am, I know I should be the tech person knowing all this, but some days. <laughs> so, so basically to give you a background, like uh, Rita just mentioned, I am, I am, my name is Upasna. I am from India. I am uh, in technology world as well since the last 13 years um, and also in the nonprofit world as well. I started my own nonprofit when I was 21 in India because I was just, uh, I was just waiting to graduate honestly and to begin, you know, mm -hmm. helping other women and girls. But um, that didn't last too long because I had to move here. And uh, once I moved here again, I, I'm still working with a lot of um, nonprofits here in, in, and in India as well. And I also voluntarily work with UN Women and your UN as well in drafting the youth policies for girls, young girls and women as well. Uh, so just to give you my perspective from what I have learned from the grassroots rural communities and also from the UN world, I would like to give you a basic, just a small perspective on what we do have a lot of laws. If, you know, if you go to UN, you will see the governments coming there every year showing, showcasing oh, what wonderful laws they have. And UN will also show what wonderful laws they have requested governments to implement. Then where is the gap? Why are the laws not able to protect women and girls? So there is definitely a gray area of society, politics and government. So I'll be sharing some stories with you all from grassroots communities. And uh, these are all the communities that I have personally been myself um, just to understand how far all these policies that we discuss in these 
high end un conferences or high end government uh, conferences that they host that okay we have developed all these laws and policies but how far have they actually reached the people who need them the most so just sharing with you three lives but these are just the three lives but these are of course a reflection of many other women you will be shocked uh, to know how even in in 21st century we have really not moved ahead anywhere please meet gulabi devi she is a 93 year old widow and she was declared a witch right next day after her husband passed away her fault nothing her husband passed away her fault was that she had her house in her name and she doesn't have any son so she only has a daughter so that is the reason her family thought okay it's 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 safe to declare her a witch that if if she is a widow at at a such an old age of course the husband had to unfortunately pass away but it has nothing to do with her being a witch or her killing her husband or anything like that but anyways they declared her a witch and now she was living homelessly or with her daughter trying to support her and help her but you know it's not easy to support a mother especially if you're a daughter especially in india so yes please meet nice gulabi devi who is not a witch but she was declared witch she was kicked out of her house and her village as well and uh, which what is it witch hunting what is witch hunting and why women are labeled as witches so witch hunting is basically just branding a woman as a witch or dyan by either witchcraft doctors priest families community neighbors friends it can be anybody you, you, they just really have to call you which once and that's if you declare a witch so basically there can be majorly two types of witch hunting declare a woman as a witch in order to take her money property and outcast her from her village and community this is the case mostly with the widows or mothers who do not have a son or if their son dies or their husband dies if they don't have if they but if they are poor women and they do not like i'm not saying that it's only if you you have something even if you don't have a property even if you don't have any money or anything even then in that case is as well you are still declared as witch because nobody wants to take care of you so irrespective of of if you have money or not if you have property or not you are still declared as witch and the second case is yes of course declare a woman as as a witch because she can't get pregnant or pregnant at all or or pregnant with a son yes if you give birth to daughters you are a witch i don't know i am a witch <laughs> considering that the superstition is that because she's possessed so she can't bear child and only the witchcraft doctors can heal her and these witchcraft doctors they they, they we, we all know how they heal the women they don't really heal them they they basically rape them you know they call them alone on the top of a mountain or some some temple in some very secluded area and then they rape them and then they send them home and if it is a son then they say oh we heal her if it's a daughter again then she's still a witch and it's the it's the child of the priest of course most of these so if you meet vimla devi and other um, child brides in the, in this picture so most of these women they don't even know that they are men are not even responsible for the gender of the child so it's like um ye, they are getting beaten up every single day they are called they are being named called as witch they are being named so many other things and left out you know they are just thrown out of their homes but they have no idea that the gender is not at all not, nothing to do with the men but it's the male chromosome so you know educating them about the basic stuff like these and these are grown up women i'm talking about forget about grown up women if you consider look at the girls who are still in school they are still playing with dolls they don't even know what sex is no sex education whatsoever forget about sex education they don't even have basic education and these are the girls like 11 years old 12 years old they just had puberty so that's it that, that that's it the parents decided let's get them married they don't even know anything about it but they just want the parents have to get them married because they can't serve them food so it's either it's since they can't serve them food so they send her away to the next house so that maybe they can give her food so it is it is sad as well but it's a very sad solution that the parents have to come up with but it's not just not just because of the food but it's also culturally you know as well 
so as we speak a lot of girls as you can see in this picture uh, many girls in the in this picture are already married by now as we discuss about gender equality since so many years i don't see anything moving uh, they have been we we discussed with the parents also so that you know please don't get them uh, married so early there is so much of the life they have to do we, we were trying to send them to schools and hopefully and they are really smart girls but apparently the parents said no this is how our tradition works they even threatened that uh, if if they if we don't if we try to interfere with their um, uh, with them with their uh, getting married then uh, you know they will you know hold protest with their communities and burn this down and you know like that it it it's not really easy to convince parents to not get their uh, girl child married as well uh, i've changed the names of the girls here but these are just two stories of poonam and meeta poonam was in school when she got her periods and uh, she went home you know to get back, get the pad or a cloth uh because a pad is a very rich luxury luxurious commodity which which they can't afford but um, just used it for the perspective but uh, he went get, uh, went back home to get something um for, for her periods and when because it's a walk to school so on her way back to school she was raped by three men so she ran away she couldn't even walk so she ran away she crawled her way through the farms and uh, she knocked the door and asked the lady for help and uh, she told her everything and she said that uh, she was raped by blah blah these men and everything she said please call my family if you can uh, she didn't know her, her unfortunate fate was that the woman that she knocked the door was a relative of these three men so instead of calling the family she called the three men again who came again and raped her again and left her out in the farm They They drove uh, far away and left her away there as well. Then finally, the family found out, and uh, even then, the family family didn't get justice because the family was from a lower caste. And then, uh, you know, they were asked to leave the village. But long lo after long battle, they were able to um, at least send the men to jail. But uh, they were free on bail in in few days or few hours. Um, second story is of Meeta, who was. deaf and dumb she couldn't even testify in the court what happened to her because her sign language was the only sign language that was known to her only and her parents so she had no idea how to communicate this to the court so coming back to the problem which is men i'm not saying all men are problem but yes they are in most of the societies so our solution really lies in the problem we don't have to look far away we need to discuss and talk to men we need to bring men into this, all these discussion forums we need to talk to men from even in the villages you know it's it, so so as you can see in the picture i was trying to talk to these men if you see the guy in the orange turban i i was um, talking to them to with like until half an hour and then he was just looking at me strangely and he he just pretended he didn't hear anything of course that is talking in the local language but he just pretended to look away and he 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 just pretended that he didn't understood a word about it and he doesn't care whatever i was trying to talk that is the older generation i understand but the same case has been reflected in the younger generation as well and even with all the technology i i you know i don't know if you guys have heard about this or not but very recently in metaverse also a woman was raped in 40 seconds after she logged in she was gang raped i don't understand where men are safe so it's not just these communities it's high technology high tech people it's it's everywhere you know women are not safe anywhere physical or virtual world so it's very important uh, for the girls to be educated and it's very important for the girls to have right ro role models from a very early age the problem is that because the girls don't see themselves as strong and brave and they don't see any role models also who are strong and brave even the, let's say if their mothers are also being beaten up every day by their husbands or their families or they are suppressed about their views or they're not going to school so of course they will also think the same but when girls start going to school from a very early age they start building their role models but we need to have better role models for the girls as well uh, that's where i feel education uh, can play a, a not only just education but the whole educated process can uh, the whole school process can take a different turn when i asked these young girls who who would they want to be when they grow up their answer was a teacher because they see a 
female teacher every day so they just knew that okay when they grow up they can be teacher and radha i don't know how many of you know radha but radha is a is a goddess <laughs> i could say krishna's by um, lover not sure but it's like a um, a character that you can play around dress up and everything but it's a it's a religious character so so they that's all they knew you know we, that's my point they didn't know that you can be a scientist they had no clue you can be a pilot you can be an engineer you can be whoever you want they just don't even know about all these um uh, things so we need to become a part of these conversation with all the girls from the age 5 among the 5 year olds if you see as per stats both boys and girls associate brilliance with their own gender but um as soon as they they grow and between age 6 to 7 only the boys still hold to that view and the girls tend to already suppress themselves and underestimate themselves and they're already discouraged they don't feel like they're equals they already start feeling like okay this is boy world girls should you know like all those things like don't cry like girl and all those mm-hmm. things and they don't think they can play football i do remember a friend telling me one day uh, his, his daughter came home and he told me that um the the f- daughter was 5 year old and she said that i must be a boy when he asked him why do you think you are a boy she said because i can play football and only boys can play football so i cannot be a girl i am definitely a boy so you know things like basics like these we need to work upon and also of course we need to uh, once we send the girls to the schools we have to work on the child marriage as well because child marriage is one of the main reasons why the girls are dropping out of school india have 12 million married children under age 10 which is population of new york plus la together so you can imagine how the numbers wedding cards in rajasthan are mandated to have the date of birth printed on the wedding card of bride and groom but nobody really validates the certificate so you can print out anything from anywhere and just show it to them and that's it so it doesn't matter that that wedding cards rule or law is not really helping anybody the rates of child marriage just in rajasthan is 65% uh if you the challenges that we faced in curbing child marriage is first of course poverty like i mentioned to choose between next meal on the table or sending one child away or more together at once you know you have to really that is a very difficult choice that you have to make protection if the daughter complains about her marriage to the cops then what will happen to her future she will be left homeless because if yes the laws are there and yes they will they might even end up arresting the parents but then what happens to the girl she will be homeless she will again fall trap in uh, you know fell into the trap of either sexual trafficking or just being you know there is there is really no home or future for her and it's it's a um most of it is societal as well in patriarchal societies girls and mothers have no say and the father himself will go and finalize the wedding and come home and just declare so there is a festival yearly once called akha teech where mass child marriages happens in farms temples and hidden from the government but i was surprised to know that there was one event one mass child marriage event which was being inaugurated by this the by the minister of that state because he was bribed so i when the government bodies are in themselves participating in these events because of the bribing and the money involved i i don't believe these laws to be working anyway it's not all bad we do have a happy story as well of the entrepreneur grandma i love her she's my favorite until like i don't, i don't know so she is 85 year old she we call her nandu ki na, dadi so nandu's grandmother in her village the buffalo that you see behind her in the picture that is her money making machine i can say so she was um, you know she's she's very smart and you know you know capable to learn and catch up thing she has a very tiny small it's not a phone it's not even a smartphone it's like a very black phone like you know like like nokia very old but she knows how to do banking from that phone and india is very good in digital banking these days at every home everybody can now get on their phones and it doesn't even have to be a smartphone and go to the digital banking so she because of the with the buffalo she sells her milk and cheese and all the daily products and then she um, was able to get loan also from the bank to support her Uh, her dairy business as well and she was she, she was independent and doing well for her and because the women younger women in her village saw that even if 85 year old dadi can do it then they can also they also joined her uh, and she also taught them how and you know this is how 
from one women to five to 10, this is how it's all growing now. And everybody's using the uh, tools that they have. It can be a buffalo a farm, uh, anything. They can stitch anything, anything that they are doing. They're all using basic technologies, um, whatever they have available to be able to. But the unfortunate part is that the husbands have the phones and the, they don't give them to their wives. So now the wives are fighting their battles that the phones belong to them and not to their husband because they can't afford two phones uh, for where we are. So these are some ground reality facts. Women not only work at home, but also in the farms and men work nowhere. Yes, I was not very surprised, but yes, men were really playing cards under the trees and just chilling with other men. But I was surprised to see women working in scorching heat in the farms, in the home with the kids. Every single thing, that's what they were doing. They were getting the money. So what happens is the once they have the crops, the men take the crops and they go. Uh, they take it to the cities and they don't give the money back to the women. There's also a very uh, religious-wise division of laws and acts that's, cause, that's not helping the government to actually curb or work on all these issues together because religious laws come into picture and then uh, every religion have different rules of their own. Um, this is a very um, basic point that the police stations do have women help desk, but they have male cops on those women help desk. So it's not really helping uh, the women also. You can see she's trying to fetch the water. And look at these men who are just playing under the... They don't want to do anything. And now she'll carry it on her head. So role of governments, UNs and societies, um, and how can they improve? UN do have several programs across the globe to help and support women. But however, they really feel badly in providing the safety net for all the girls and women. There have been a lot of programs where UN went into the rural communities to encourage girls and women, but uh, then they left from there, leaving all the girls and women unsafe. And the women were raped and a lot of uh, such cases happened in the past. So UN and government needs to work in partnership with local police and community leaders as a basic mandatory requirement before they jump into all these communities. They should support them legally and financially as well so then they can break, the, they can come out of the cycle of, of poverty and the same domestic violence. They need to also incentivize the girls and women so that they can we can encourage the participation among girls and women. And UN should hold the countries accountable for their goals. They don't hold them accountable. They come every year. All the countries come every year. Showcase the oh, what wonderful laws we have. None of them are none of them are being implemented. Actually being implemented. I really doubt how much percentage they are being implemented. On top of it, add COVID-19 to it. And of course, how we know how COVID impacted all of us in so many ways, but COVID left life altering impacts for girls and women for hard to, especially for hard to reach communities because they don't have technologies or um, they don't have, you know, all these nice, wonderful developed countries, uh, you know, food and uh, internet and everything available to them, especially for pregnant women with no medical care access and no transportation. Um, I was pregnant myself and gave birth during peak of COVID. I know how medical services were in US. It, it was horrible. I, I can't even imagine what women went to, the, you know, in the developing countries with nothing, uh, no access to them. Um, of course, domestic violence also went up during lockdown and just got us back to square one and 20 years behind, I feel, because now they, they were they were not able to escape because of the lockdown and the lockdowns were very strict in India. So everybody was really locked up overnight. So you were where you were for, for months to go. Girls left school as they don't have access to such high technologies, computers, laptops, internet, and now they are also left behind. So where do we go from here? I, I, so we just need to understand that this is not just a presentation but representation and plea of so many young girls and women who are just waiting for us to do something about it um it's it's 21st century and we should not be discussing these until now but i think covid just put us back 20 years behind for girls and women so we need to double up our efforts and i'm really sorry for taking a lot of time um, for the presentation but um yep here i am back Sorry, guys. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank yeah. you. We couldn't see your face Sorry. during that time, but the, the slides were so wonderful in terms of informing us and laying out what we need to be working on. So really appreciate all of your Thanks. efforts. Yeah. And so um, so the, our next speaker is Dana Compton. 
So uh, very glad that she could be here with us today. She's the managing director and publisher of the American Society of Civil Engineers. And she's gonna be talking about how we make STEM programs affordable for girls, women, and minorities. Let's get to some of those solutions. Dana? Thank you, Deborah, and thanks for inviting me to join you today. I'm gonna to go ahead and share my screen and just let me know when you can see that. Everything? Yes, we can there? see it. Yep, we can Wonderful. see it. Thank you, thank you. So like Deborah said, my name is Dana Compton. I'm Managing Director and Publisher at ASCE, American Society of Civil Engineers. So I'm gonna to talk today um, about why it's essential not only to make STEM programs affordable, but accessible and inclusive for all underrepresented minority groups. What challenges exist and some examples of what civil societies like ASCE and associated organizations can do to minimize these barriers. My perspective, of course, is very different from Upasana's um, more US focused, but I think you know, definitely some solutions that I hope can spark um, ideas for, for things that can be you know, rolled out more broadly across the globe um, and a real focus on the importance of education for these groups. So let's talk about why this is so essential. Why do STEM fields need to be diverse and inclusive? At a high level, making progress toward the UN Sustainable Development Goals not only impacts, but requires the involvement of all communities across the globe. Looking specifically at civil engineering, um, I've pulled together some comments from our ASCE DEI Best Practices Resource Guide, as well as a collection um, on diversity and inclusion in civil and environmental engineering that we published in our Journal of Civil Engineering Education in 2018. At their heart, civil engineers are problem solvers. They solve problems for society, which is made up of people from diverse backgrounds, identities, and cultures who have diverse interests and needs. In particular, they're challenged with solving problems that impact many facets of societal well being. These include clean air and water, waste management, transportation, drainage and flood mitigation, land development, safe structures, and so forth. Those communities are not one size fits all and neither are the solutions to the challenges they face. In fact, while the underlying challenge, for example, clean water might be the same for different populations, the approach to solving it is usually very different depending on the societal context. For civil engineering solutions to serve society well, they need to include perspectives that are representative of a society's rich diversity. That requires engaging people from sorry, from more diverse backgrounds in the profession and ensuring that they solve problems with, not just for the communities they serve. So before we dive straight into challenges and solutions, let's uh, take a quick look at the magnitude of the problem. Demand for engineers and practice is up. Deborah alluded earlier to the 2013 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This is really driving the green economy and green jobs we need engineers to move these technologies and solutions forward. But women and minority groups remain severely underrepresented. According to the 50K Coalition, and I'll talk a little bit more about this group in a bit, the, the engineering industry in the US comprises 86% men and only 14% women, and is nearly 67% white. This inequity can be traced directly back to the educational landscape. According to the American Society for Engineering Education, US college enrollments in engineering are only 23% female and white students account for 52% of enrollments. Sadly, the picture gets somewhat bleaker when we look at degree completion. 78% of bachelor's degrees in engineering in the US are awarded to men. And although enrollments are 52% white students, 62% of bachelor's degrees recipients are white. Only 4% are Black or African American, 11% Hispanic, and 15% Asian American. While this data is US centric, the problem doesn't stop at our borders. The 50K Coalition that I referred to earlier um, is a collaborative organization. Uh, it, there are 40 member organizations, and this was initially formed by the Society of Women Engineers, 
the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, the National Society of Black Engineers, and the American Indian Science and Engineering Society. ASCE is a member of the 50K Coalition. In summarizing the educational gap, the coalition estimates that 93,000 engineering bachelor's degrees are awarded annually in the US, but few, fewer than one third of those graduates are from minority populations or are women. The coalition has set an aspirational goal of producing 50,000 underrepresented minority and women engineering graduates annually. Toward this end, the coalition has agreed to a common agenda and developed a comprehensive strategy. However, a multitude of challenges exist in increasing diversity, inclusivity, and rep representation in STEM at large. These range from lack of awareness of what a career in STEM actually looks like and how to pursue a STEM role to the extreme homogeneity that delivers a visual message that STEM is not a place for women and minorities to practical issues like educational gaps and financial obstacles and lack of support on the educational journey toward a STEM career. Despite these challenges, organizations like ASCE and the 50K Coalition are implementing programs and offering resources to counter each of them. Starting at the most basic level, awareness of STEM at a young age can pique the interests of girls and underrepresented minority students. ASCE offers a number of programs aimed at raising awareness to help build the next generation of civil engineers. At home, kids can complete everyday engineering STEM at home projects for which we have instructional videos and documents on our website. These activities were developed for our documentary, Dream Big, Engineering Our World, which kids and adults can screen on Netflix. Kids interest, interested in learning about real life civil engineering can also contact us to arrange for a video chat or an email exchange with a practicing civil engineer to learn more about their experiences. ASCE is building a network of outreach champions to promote civil engineering to the pre-college audience. These champions can visit classrooms in their local communities, but they can also host outreach events outside of schools in public libraries, at YMCAs or after school programs. ASCE provides all the training and resources an ASCE member needs to be a successful champion. ASCE members also sponsor civil engineering clubs in high schools that let students meet, work with mentors, and explore civil engineering through activities, lessons, and field trips. If a school is interested in a club but doesn't know an ASCE member in its area, our pre-college outreach team can work with them to make a connection. Just to illustrate a few of the more accessible resources, this is an example of one of the STEM at home instructional videos on our website. So these activities require relatively few simple materials. They're geared towards different age groups from elementary through high school, and they illustrate the real world problems that civil engineers work to solve. So in this case, designing strong earthquake resilient buildings to reduce damage and keep people safe. Even more simply than that, ASCE strives to deliver clear and accessible messaging to the public, including students, parents, and educators about what civil engineers do and how they help people and the planet. The next barrier I wanna talk about, and Upasana had alluded to this earlier, um, is current homogeneity. The adage, that, the adage that you can't be what you can't see is absolutely true. You need representation to see yourself in a role. To attract girls and minority students into STEM, it's important that we intentionally create visibly inclusive environments so that those who don't look like the majority feel they belong. Some tactics toward, toward this end include highlighting and recognizing the achievements of women and underrepresented groups through awards, media, and all communications, especially those geared to the public. The ASCE New Faces of Civil Engineering program strives to do just that. Through this program, we recognize 10 students and 10 young professionals each year. An emphasis is placed on showcasing the accomplishments of women and underrepresented minority engineers. The student honorees are awarded a scholarship, which serves a dual function of breaking down financial barriers. And their profiles are featured in ASCE's online news and information hub, the CE source, and during Engineers Week. Again, this intentional and visible recognition of diverse populations in a STEM program illustrates that students from all groups have a place. 
At a very practical level, we must work to break down the systemic issues that prevent women and minority groups from achieving their STEM goals. The 50K Coalition is particularly focused on this aspect and states that it will leverage existing programs, networks, and partnerships with higher ed institutions to achieve a common goal. The 50K Coalition Dashboard and Scorecard tracks metrics such as high school senior completion of prerequisite courses, community college transfer rates, freshman retention, and many others, and then pursues strategies and a common agenda to remediate pain points. Perhaps most obviously, financial barriers to entry and completion need to be addressed. The 50K Coalition works on funding strategies, and organizations like ASCE also provide an array of scholarships for which students can apply, as well as fellowships for graduate students. Finally, one of the problems that we see in the K-12 pipeline is that girls and minority students may have an interest or an aptitude at STEM, in STEM at some point along their educational path, but don't continue the journey from elementary through middle school, high school, college, and eventually to a degree. Support is needed to retain their talents through the entire educational pipeline. In many cases, these students do not have natural support and guidance within their family for any variety of reasons. This could be as simple as being the first in their family to pursue a STEM path or the first to pursue a college education at all. In the US, this, they may be the only person in the family who speaks English. As a result, their parents or other family support may not be familiar with how to navigate the educational system or how to achieve the requirements needed to get to the next step. Mentorship is a fundamental way to fill this support gap. A personal mentor who has walked the path before can make the difference between a student who achieves their goals and one who does not. A mentor can provide guidance on requirements and programs, can act as a champion by writing recommendation letters and statements of support, especially when prerequisite requirements are lacking, and can be a connection to scholarship and loan opportunities. Perhaps most importantly, a mentor reinforces their mentee's strengths and interests to help them keep their eye on their goals when the road is difficult. ASCE's online mentor match program connects students and young members with industry professionals in one-on-one -on -one relationships. Formal mentorship fills one need, but peer-to-peer -peer support is another essential component. It's important that students have an opportunity to connect with others who are experiencing the same internal and external struggles. Creating cohorts of diverse students and then mentoring those cohorts has been a strategy many colleges have employed to build a pipeline and improve retention. These cohorts are another step toward a visibly inclusive atmosphere for all social and cultural groups. Outside the college environment, ASCE has hosted an event called Conversations with Civil Engineers at the National Society of Black Engineers Society of Hispanic and Professional Engineers, and Society of Women Engineers Conventions. We haven't done this, unfortunately, since before COVID, and hope to return to it, um, but it's been a great way to bring together a cohort of students and introduce them to the various technical areas of civil engineering. Overall, I'm incredibly proud of ASCE's efforts, and I hope these programs can be a model for others around the world. I'm excited to see more people from these groups, not only in engineering, but in STEM as a whole in the future. This um, slide just summarizes the various ASE resources I've referred to. I don't know if our slides will be, will be shared or disseminated in any way, but providing some links here um, where you can find more information. And finally, before I wrap up, I do just wanna take a moment to express my, my deep appreciation to these wonderful ASE colleagues. While I have the privilege of speaking about ASCE's efforts and initiatives in this forum, these three women are doing the hard work every day to implement our DEI and outreach programs. Thank you, Lisa Black, Eden Butler, Leslie Payne, and indeed all of the ASCE staff who support these programs. Thank you especially for your input on this presentation. I couldn't have prepared it without you. And thank you to all of you for your time and attention. If you'd like more information or have any questions, feel free to send me an email or find me on Twitter or LinkedIn. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Donna. It was a really eye-opening. Uh, now, let me introduce Dr. Donna Jenny, who is our next speaker. Uh, she had started her career in education sector 
as an English teacher and has contributed four decades of priceless work to improve the quality of education in Massachusetts. For those who do not know where Massachusetts is, it is in the United States. She's a skilled writer and excellent editor. She has won an award for the National Council of Teachers of English and her teaching of writing. And she has edited several books, received PhD in psychology. Donna, take it from here. Oh, you are mute. Donna, we can't hear you. So on the bottom left hand is the mic and just click on it. Thanks. Yeah, there you go. go. Thank you all for being with us for this program. It's my privilege and honor to talk to you today about mental health programs in schools and community for the prevention of gun violence during the time of COVID. Over the last 10 years, the United States has witnessed a striking increase in school shootings. Oh. Most legislation addressing the issue has been focused on gun control. However, it's important to note that school, the school shooting crisis is a multifaceted problem that will not be resolved by gun regulations alone. Research is clear that social emotional learning programs beginning in preschool and continuing through grade 12 should address the underlying issues that drive individuals to gun violence. These programs will provide students with the skills necessary to address aggressive behaviors, as well as increase overall student well being and academic achievement, according to research. In COVID 22, during the Omicron, gun violence is also linked in 2022 by their dual contribution to a growing burden of trauma, contributing to further violence and presenting an urgent public health problem. When asked about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, reactions to COVID-19, 26% of surveyed students in Massachusetts reported experiencing three or more reactions in the previous month. This data was obtained from the Mass Department of Public Health on their gun violence prevention programs. PYD, positive youth development, is based on the idea that young people developed through connections with caring adults who understand the development process and never give up on them. PYD promotes self-efficacy, positive self-concept, and hope for the future. Funded programs in Massachusetts include street outreach to find disenfranchised youth where they are and engage them in programming and mentoring with a focus on relationship building and improved positive youth development. PYD outcomes. According to the Massachusetts Department of Health, in 2018, Massachusetts was among states having the lowest firearm death rates in the nation. I'm going to share my screen now so I can read a letter from the City of Springfield's Police Commissioner, Cheryl Clapwood, that I think will be of interest to us all. In 2019, the Springfield Police Department entered into a contract with Behavioral Health Network. The agreement allowed for a clinician from BHN to have a police radio and respond to calls within the police department when mental health calls come in. It also allows the clinicians to call for a cruiser to respond to their calls if they self-dispatch. We currently have six clinicians and they operate on two shifts, the day and the evening shift. When a call comes in for a person in a mental health crisis, the clinician is dispatched with a cruiser for a joint response. This working arrangement has been well received by the officers and their clinicians. The officers went from being skeptical about having a clinician with them to being upset when one is not available for an assist. In 2021, there were 1,927 calls for police service, which included an attached BHN clinician. BHN made more than 800 contacts during those calls. Reviewing calls for mental health issues during 2021, on only one quarter of the calls was a clinician not needed. It was about the same amount of calls that an officer was relieved by the clinician to go back into service. For more than half the calls, both the clinician and officers were needed to successfully complete the call. 
Between COVID-19, the lack of in-person service, a rise in drug abuse, tensions in society, mental health calls have risen over 30% for police. The police are dispatched to an irritated, violent, or distraught person causing a disturbance or assault. No, we never know if the call is a mental health call, drug overdose call, a call involving alcohol intoxication, or anger or rage. Officers now more than ever are being asked to be proficient in emergency medical assessment, knowledgeable in mental health and crisis situations, proficient in de-escalization techniques, marital counseling, child counseling, all by being cool, calm, and collected. The demands are greater than ever, as are the expectations. Along with all of that, police sentiment hit an all-time low the past two years, and recruitment and retainment are difficult to best. Commissioner Clapper contingent in her letter pointing out difficulties that police departments across the country are all experiencing. Mental health calls are extremely challenging for law enforcement. We need to stop and prevent violent behavior while gaining the space and time for evaluating the reasons why the behavior is happening. Having the clinicians on the calls with us has proven very successful. Sometimes the clinician is able to identify the person involved and obtain a history immediately on their laptop, which informs us on the conditions and prior issues of the individual. At first response, mental health and crisis calls are similar to drug-induced individuals, especially hallucinogens and PCP, which we see a lot of. It also takes time to recognize if the individual is not able to control anger or emotions and is in a fit of rage. I have sent several officers to crisis intervention training and it's proven very beneficial. Training takes a week and the problems are not having officers who want to attend, but rather having enough staffing to send officers for a week. The officers who respond to calls with the clinicians are learning from them while answering the calls. This working relationship has been beneficial for both sides. We have experienced a high volume of mental health calls in our middle and high schools as well. The past year we have seen an increase from one call for a student in crisis a week to 10 days per school, up to about two to three crisis calls per week for each middle and high school. Springfield has more than 43 schools. Student resource offices can assist by calling for a BHN clinician or ambulance if needed. Most of the immediate care is provided by school mental health resources. The issues we are faced with is a lack of treatment facilities or beds available for these young people. We have two major hospitals in the Springfield area, Mercy Medical Center and Bay State Health Systems. Both are usually full in their children and adolescents mental health treatment program. Parents are usually advised to make appointments for follow-up counseling and appointments if the behavior is not considered life-threatening or aggressive. Officers assist, but we're also limited on resources that are available. Officers are frustrated when it comes to holding or placing individuals who display mental health issues, drug addiction, or alcohol addiction issues. Years ago, we had an alcohol addiction placement program, a drug addiction treatment program, and hospital beds with available for mental health treatment. None of these are available to us now in a time when society is facing an increase in all three. And I must commend Cheryl Clapperwood, Commissioner for the City of Springfield for the Police Department and her entire department, those men and women in blue who serve us and our children every single day. My conclusion from the above information, as a society, we have to do better with mental health. Education is the key. Helping students and supporting them in their quest to make their lives better helps to improve communities too. It's really that simple. It's the funding that's difficult. Thank you all. Thank you, Donna. And I see uh, Tara has uh, joined us. Uh, uh, maybe let me tell Tara, condense it in three, four minutes. We don't have too much of time left. So go ahead, Tara, start your presentation. Can't hear your... Uh, microphone is off. 
I think you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah. yeah, okay. So Go just, so, just so, so you know, yeah. if you can present in the next few minutes, fine. We can keep this site open so that we have time for discussion questions and answers for those who can stay. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, but condense it. So, hello, can you hear me? Am I yes. audible? Yes, yeah. yes. So, so yeah. So uh, I'm just based at uh, Rajasthan, Bhilwada. And I'm working uh, on women and children issue uh, for last 35 years. And uh, this is the core heart of uh, Rajasthan, you know, the place where I'm staying, where the literacy rate is very low and uh, so many customaries laws which are totally against women. And all these, you know, uh, things are uh, prevailing here. So basically, my organization is uh, known as Balva Mahila Chetna Samiti, uh, which is just working on the issues, basically like domestic violence, uh, prevention, uh, dowry prevention, witch hunting, and uh, women's assets uh, ownership like this, you know, we are working on various issues. But basically, uh, I have just, you know, documented around 125 cases on witch hunting. Witch hunting is the most, you know, social problem here. And uh, five women have been brutally killed in the name of uh, witch. So, uh, you know, we had a uh, law just in uh, 2015, but the law is not implemented on the ground. So we are struggling still uh, to implement the law on the ground. Uh, secondly, here, the girls after the COVID has just got child marriages in a huge number. Earlier, they used to go to school. So they were just away from the home and they were just spending their time in school. But uh, in this COVID period, uh, they are not going to school and schools are closed. So they are just sitting home and they are in the eyes of everyone. And just, you know, the society, the family, everyone says, oh, you are growing uh, and you are not getting married. And uh, so a lot of girls got married during this COVID. Then uh, there was a lot of uh, abortions uh, in the slums, you know, because we have distributed more than 5,000 uh, Russian kids in the slums. So what I just found that mostly the woman got aborted three, four months abortion was most common because of the malnutrition. And uh, now the girls, who were just in sixth or seventh standard, they got married. So now they are dropped, uh, drop out and uh, not going to school. And now parents are just, you know, insisting uh, them to go to their in-laws and all this. So uh, I should just say that the COVID has ruined uh, most of girls' future and uh, neither they are just, you know, able to go to school and yet the schools are not working here. So uh, child marriage, yes, child marriage rates is very high. And uh, in the school, mostly nowadays, what I found uh, that the small girls are just, you know, getting harassment from the school teachers itself. So the uh, child abuse has increased surprisingly for, uh, you know, for last three, four years. I have just noticed that the girls are just abused in the school itself by the teachers. So uh, overall, I, I should just, you know, say that it's a difficult time for the women, for the girls uh, in different way are that they are just, you know, struggling uh, for the, uh, you know, for their future and for their life. So uh, we are just working in the schools nowadays because they are, most of the girls are no, uh, not going to school and they are dropped out. So we are just going and talking uh, with the parents that why don't you just send the girls now to school? They say, no, they have just gone to the in-laws and uh, they got married uh, during this COVID. So uh, it's really very, uh, you know, it, uh, it's a issue of worries for all of us that uh, the girls who were just, you know, uh, in eighth or ninth standard, 
uh, now they are just you know uh, in their in laws house and uh, not coming to the parents house so the studies are just you know they are drop out girls now so uh, yes we are working on various so social customary laws uh, we are just working on nata pratha and uh, ata sata and so many you know uh, this customary laws prevails in rajasthan so that is a uh, great challenge for us you know the women are just sold in the name of marriage uh, three times four times they are just you know sold from one place to another that is a great challenge for us child marriage is a great challenge because government does nothing you know they just make uh, just you know called the law child uh, child marriage law but uh, on ground practically i don't find any you know government uh, implementation on this child marriage law so uh, yes we are definitely working on the issues and uh, it, it is 35 years to my organization so uh, definitely we, we could just support more than 10 15000 women uh, especially on domestic uh, violence and uh, many other uh, issues uh, related to uh, women and children yes thank you thank you, thank so you much. sara uh, yeah. breaking this uh, real social ugliness of rajasthan yeah. forefront i will do my best to bring it attention to all my friends at uh, social development department and unesco and hopefully we could help you out with it but thank you, you so much job and continue doing it thank okay, you so Deborah. much thank you Deborah, what what do you say? So we I don't see questions. any. Yeah, I don't see any questions in the chat or comments. But we can open it up at this point if people have sure. questions or comments. If you would put them in the chat, we'll recognize them and we can take them on. Um, I want to thank Rita. None of this would have happened without Rita and her unending commitment to bring together people who were doing good work. I just want to tell you, I was personally inspired in multiple ways. I have some organizations in um, different countries that I'm going to work more on this, uh, the female uh, discrimination and abuse that's going on, and also the DEI initiatives from ASCE. I, I'm going to take that and use that as a model in our uh, Green Jobs Initiative internationally. So that was great, Dana. Thank you. So uh, Tara, Upsana, Donna. Uh, thanks to all of you for your presentations. Let me just check to see: are there closing comments? Do people have questions? Well, I thank you, Deborah. You did great. Or moderating it, you you are a good a moderator. Pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Upsana, did you want to say something? Yes, I just wanted to introduce everybody again to Talaji because I know I didn't get a chance earlier, but I know she is very humble. She wouldn't uh, share a lot more. Uh, things as she's been doing at grassroots and uh, that's why i would like to connect her to everybody and introduce her to everyone again here uh, she has been working with, for 35 years like i said for uh, with a lot of young girls and women not only just in school like she just mentioned but also to stop child marriages so she would go door to door also and uh, she, like i uh, you saw in my presentation about witch hunting that was uh, a project with tara ji as well so she has been doing all those uh hidden cameras uh, sc scams also she you know exposed a lot of them in uh, big newspapers news as well because uh, she would hide herself and you know and be present herself to the priest with the hidden camera you know they would beat her out but she would still not reveal her true self so there have been a lot of amazing work tara ji have been done and she have been awarded as well but i really feel that this would be the best platform for all of us to connect to tara ji as well so that we can build a channel and like dana's presentation was amazing you know stem program for girls so for all, all of you who don't know tara ji have recently adopted a school in rajasthan and she's been working with girls there for and encouraging them to take take up stem subjects as well so that would be like an example on how we can work with tara ji and maybe have an online session with her with uh, with the girls tara ji someday with all of us maybe we can have like a zoom session with them and you know we can also uh, like dana mentioned as well that we need to have better role models we need to show them what they can achieve and be there and uh, 
So I'm really glad, Taraji, because of COVID, there was only one nice thing that happened. We went on Zoom and we could finally have you. I wish you were in UN when we do these events in UN, but but this is great as well. But um, but yes, another fun fact is Rita and Taraji are from same state in India. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. So very nice. Um, I'm really glad to uh, to have this is this was a very nice and fruitful uh, meeting. I feel you know I, I learned so so much from all of you. Deborah, amazing to, like share See, the resources why, that you. Share. Nice. That's why I wanted to develop our core group before yes. giving it to the WHO or any of the UN <laughs> agencies. They are established yes. anyway, but let us establish yes. our own agenda. So yes. now I'll exactly. send, uh, send me the video link of the Zoom. Uh, and I uh, Send me the video link of the Zoom and I'll try to look into the UN site, see if we gone into the UN thing. And if I find it, I'll send it to you. And it will yeah, be I think if you can just maybe put your website in to the chat so that people who do want to follow up. I'm going to put this person on mute. Okay, so if you can just put the WHEC website into the chat, Rita, is that okay? Or tell okay, it to okay, me. I'm, and I'm doing that. I'm doing exactly Great. that. So, so yeah. that that way, if people who want to get more involved, you can yes. reach out through that website. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And um, we really, I think the more hands that we have to do this good work, the more yeah. solutions that we're going to create. So any other thoughts? People, a lot of people have said, thank you for a good program. Yes. Um, I, and how much, uh, how many people signed up eventually? Well, we're still recording. So we let's talk recording. about, yeah, we can talk about all those details later. Okay, good. I just wanted to get the WHEC. Well, it's just, I can go ahead and pull it up if you'd like. Okay, here here it go. is right there. So womenshealthsection.com. Section .com. Okay. They can link on it, uh, click on it. And yep, and it gets you right there. And for those of you who have not seen that site before, I'll just share my screen real quick so that you can see what it'll take you to. Lots yes. of resources there. Yes, it's a six languages. Yes. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. I think we'll close up. I'm going to turn off the recording, if that's OK. That's fine. And then we can just have an informal discussion. So hold on just one minute. And there we go.